does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. But bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Amen. I have read for your hearing from uh, Luke 19, verse 1, verse 11 through 27. You may be seated. I'd like to use for a subject just for a few minutes. Take this opportunity. Take this opportunity. Let's bow our hands for a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for being in your presence. Thank you for your love, your joy, and your peace. Thank you for your children who are here today to study your word. Open up their spiritual understanding that we may receive your word. Place it in our hearts so we will not sin against you. If there's somebody here today who does not know Jesus as their Savior, Father, it is our prayer that your Holy Spirit would touch their heart and they would say, what must I do to be saved in Jesus' name? Amen. Take this opportunity. Just give me a few minutes. I want to give you uh, three points to the lesson today, and that is this. Number one, and take this opportunity. Three points. You can write it down. The king gives opportunity. Point one, the king gives opportunity. Point two, the king reward those who use their opportunity. Point two, the king rewards those who use their opportunity. And then point three, the king condemns wasted opportunity. The king condemns wasted opportunity. Let me say those three points again. The king gives opportunity. Point two, the king rewards those who use their opportunity. And point three, the king condemns wasted opportunity. Let's look at point number one. The king gives opportunity. In verse 12, it says that there was a noble man. A noble man who at birth went out to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. Just want to let you right, know right now, this is a parable of Jesus, so we have to... I'll just show you who Jesus is talking about. Well, the noble man that became a king is talking about Jesus Christ himself. Oh, yes, Jesus Christ is that noble man. He became a king of Israel, right? And where, where did he go back? He went back and ascended up to heaven to his kingdom. That's what he did. So he called uh, uh, these ten servants of his, right, and gave them ten minors. Now, you might ask the question, what is a minor? A minor is, uh, uh, is wages, three months' worth of wages. That's, his, that's exactly what it is. It's money. Three months worth of money. And it's, it, it, so that's what God gave them. Jesus gave them ten servants. And he gave them each a minor, which represented uh, the money. Now watch this. Who does the servants and the minor represent? They represent all of us who believe in the kingdom of God. So the servants represent us who are working in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's, it's all of us who have Jesus in our lives. It's all of us who have, you, we use the treasure of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, to reach the lost. So if you've been born again, you are actually supposed to use the treasure of God, which is the word of God, to reach the lost. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said this. He says, go into all the world, teaching them, right? Whatsoever I taught you, and baptize them, make disciples of them, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Every believer need to know that you are supposed to be working in God's kingdom. Amen? It's, it's, it's amazing. I told you, I, I never planned this. I never how my sermons are going to come out. Isn't it amazing that this sermon comes out about working in the kingdom on the day that we, what, we install our officers today? Isn't it something that we talk about people working in ministry and we talk about installing people to do a work? And right now, this passage of scripture is verse 11 through 27 and rightfully so falls on a Sunday that we're talking about ministry. Jesus says to these ten servants this. He told them right there in those verses, put my money to work, he said, until I come back. So the king is commanding them to use the opportunity, use the money that they have to do what? To work for the kingdom of God until he comes back. In other words, Jesus didn't just give us the gospel. 
just for us to sit here and listen to it. He gave us the gospel to use it. He gave us the gospel to go out and tell somebody about Jesus Christ. He entrusted to us as born again believers the good news that Jesus is savior of the world. Why? So we can tell somebody who is lost so they can be saved. The number one job in the church is to what? Witness to people. We are not a social club. We are not an entertainment center. We are a hospital, a spiritual hospital. This is a place where all sick people come and can be healed by the power of God. Somebody need to say amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spiritually speaking, we were all born in sin and shaped into iniquity. So this is the place where we come to get spiritually healed, spiritually fed, so we can do what God called us to do. Our duty, our duty as servants of Jesus is to invest into God's word. Amen. So how, how do we do that? Yeah, that's a good answer. How do we invest in God's word? This is how you spread the gospel. You got to tell somebody. Oh, yes, this is how you use that treasure that got you saved. You got to tell somebody else how you became a Christian. Oh, yeah, that's how the gospel is spread. It is spread through other believers standing up, going out, telling somebody else who is lost what God has done for, it, for them. See, it stands to reason that we need to understand in order for me to confess Jesus is my Savior. I first got to know the Word of God before I can give the Word of God. So it's, it's amazing to me why I now know why a lot of Christians don't go out and tell people about Jesus. Is it properly so that they don't have the Word of God in them? Because in order for you to have the Word of God in you, you got to read the Bible. You need to come to Bible class. You need to come to Sunday school. Well, Reverend, I, I don't do that. I study on my own at home. Well, yep, it, it really shows that you study at home on your own, too. Church is over packed with people. You, you, you're so study, you study so much at home that you tell everybody in your neighborhood that Jesus is real. So you overcrowd the church. Watch this. Our first priority then, if our job is to witness, then our first priority is to study. You have to know your Bible. How is it, you know, I don't know if you ever ran into a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. I ran into a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses in my life. And it's amazing to me that you would talk to a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses and they'll tell you, yeah, I used to go to church. I used to go to this church. I used to go to that church. And I said, yeah. And uh, evidently, you didn't study when you was in the church. Because if you studied when you was in the Baptist church, you would have found out that Jesus is the Savior of the world. You trying to come knocking on my door telling me that what I've learned in the church is not right. I'm telling you that what you learn is not right. So the thing is this, you've got to become. But if you don't know nothing, next thing you know, I see you being a Jehovah's Witness or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a New Ager or whatever else is out there because we refuse to get into the word of God to find out why we sitting in this building today. See, we, 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 listen, we're not here because of mama and grandmama and grandpa and cousin. You should be here because Jesus saved your soul. You should know without a shadow of a doubt that if you died right this second, heaven will be your home. You should already know that. And can't nobody, I don't care who they are, how many degrees they have behind their name, shake your faith to, yeah, I was wondering if I, whether I was saved or not. No, you should know if you saved or not. That's why you study. That's why you get into the word of God. That's why we got to tell the world who we believe in. You see, it's an amazing thing when we study God's word. You know what happens? The desire to tell other people about Jesus begin to rise in you. The, the, the desire to tell the world how much he changed your life. You're going to tell just because you're in it. You're, you're watching God change your life. Don't you want God to change somebody else's life? Let alone your, your family members. Let alone your, your children and your grandchildren and everybody around you. If God is changing you, don't you want God to change them? But in order for God to change them, people need to see Jesus in you. Every time I 
not seeing. She always doing this. If, if she getting to heaven, I know I'm getting in. I just know. I know I'm going to make it in. That's what they say about us. They say we're not serious about what we say we believe in. We in church on Sunday and we playing with the devil on Monday. They don't believe. They believe that we pray in church. But I'm here to tell you, we need to stop playing in church and believe that God is real. And be what we say we are that this Bible says that we are. So the more you meditate in the word of God, the more on fire you going to get. Oh, yes. Nobody have to prime you. We don't have to pump you up. It's going to automatically happen. The more you read the word, the more you pray, the more you get into it, guess what? God going to take over. That's the way he works. That's the way he works. We, 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 don't, we don't want our family members and friends and neighbors to go to hell. No, we don't. That's why we got saved. We, we, we heard that there was a hell that we can shun away from. We found out that we were lost, and therefore we didn't want to go there. So why in the world would I tell somebody else there's a place you need to run away from, and the only way you can get away from it, you got to make Jesus your Savior. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We got to share the good news about that treasure. Notice what he says in verse 14. He says, listen, but his subjects hated him. They hated the king and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. Listen, the world doesn't want Jesus to be their savior. And even though Jesus died over 2,000 years ago, for who? The whole world. Jesus died for everyone. I just really want you to understand. He didn't die for the church members. He died for everyone. He died for the prostitute. He died for the homosexual. He died for the drug addict. He died for the child molester. He died for the murderer. He died for the liar. He died for them all. He, no, see, because, you know, I, I've been in church all my life. Yeah, I've been in church all of my life. So I didn't get the opportunity to go out into the world and do half the stuff that all the worldly people doing. Don't mean I could have done it in the church. I could have done it in the church as well. But God got, got, got me at an early age to get involved in the church. So therefore, I think there's a lot of people in the church who, get, who grew up in the church who think that they don't have to talk to the people outside the church. It's amazing that we only want to fellowship with one another. It's amazing I only want to talk to another church member. It's amazing we so caught up on, I want to go to this church, I want to go to that church, let's fellowship with them. Why is it that we only want to fellowship with one another? We need to be out there fellowshipping with those who are not saved. I just want to let you know, I used to be in this ministry, it was, it was, it was funny when Sister Eli and I first met, we used to be in this ministry, it was, it was kind of off, yeah, they were off, they believed that everything was a spirit, right? So they really believed at this point, it's like 30, 25, 26 years ago, they believed that everything was a spirit, so they didn't want to connect with anybody outside of the church. So then I had to realize after we left, I said, wait a minute, God didn't call us to have a Christian grocery store. Well, only Christians go to it. God didn't have us to go to a Christian clothing store because, you know, there's too many demons in the world. So I can't. So, listen, your kids go to the same school they go to. Y'all go to the same grocery store. You go to the movies. You go to the bowling alley. You taking trips on the same boats. You getting on the same planes with them. As a matter of fact, the, the, the person who rides the plane could be a homosexual flying the plane, and you don't even know it. Can't get on the plane because he's a homosexual. We got to be in the world. We don't have to be of the world. Don't worry about what they doing. You got to let your little light shine. Right? We can't be Mr. Judgmental this and judgmental that. Listen, if you tell people about Jesus, maybe they can turn their life around. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Jesus said, they hated Jesus. Yes, they did. They rejected him. They didn't want him. But Jesus died for them anyway. Isn't that something? He died for the entire world. That brings me down to point number two. I told you I wanted to be like so just So one, point number one was, listen, you have this opportunity, which is to preach the gospel. Here's point two. The king rewards those who use their opportunity. As you read through the parable that we read there, it says that Jesus, the king, came back 
Oh yeah, he came back and then he sent out the service and they worked and they gained. He went moment to let you know when when we stand before God as a Christian, you're not being stand, you're not standing before God to be judged whether you're gonna make it to heaven or hell. Uh-uh. Jesus already did that for you at the cross. But you still gotta stand before Jesus. See, if you 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 say that you know Jesus as your savior and you're gonna stand before him. He's not gonna judge whether or not you should go to hell or heaven. You're already going to heaven. This this is what he's going to say to you. What did you do with the opportunity I gave you? What did you do from the time you was nine to the time I took you all home? What did you do with your opportunity? How many people did you touch? How many people did you reach? What did you do with the time I gave you as a Christian right there on earth? That's what he's going to ask you. And what are we going to say? Well, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what some of these people. He gave two examples. The first one said, in verse 16, the first one came and said, Sir, your minor has earned ten more minor. He gave him one. This particular servant earned ten. I want you to understand this. All of us are not going to get the same opportunity. Just like all of us don't make the same amount of money. You know, so when you listen to the, the get wealth, get rich preacher on TV, you really need to make try to make sense when he try to tell you all Christians are gonna be millionaires and billionaires. Listen, from the beginning of time till now, you tell me whenever, ever, just tell me, correct me, you can raise your hand right now. Let me know, has there ever been a time in human history where everybody on the planet made the same amount of money? Can anybody tell me? Oh, okay. The poor you're gonna have with you always. There's going to be some millionaires, there's going to be some billionaires, and there's going to be some lazy folks walking around don't want to do nothing. Always. So just like different people make different amount of money, watch this. All of us are not going to have the same opportunity to witness as many people as we can. Some people are going to witness to 10,000. Some people are going to witness to 5,000. God may give you the opportunity to only witness to five. So watch this. It doesn't matter how many you witness to. The question is, are you witnessing? <laughs> so, so the opportunity that you have. See, some of us will have a platform to get on television. Some of, us, some of us will have the platform to be on the radio. All of us don't have that opportunity. But whatever opportunity you have, you're supposed to be spreading the gospel. He took this opportunity. Don't, be, don't feel bad that he took one and made ten. That was just his opportunity. Because look, there's another guy. There's another one. Look at verse 17. Well, when God said to him, well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a small matter, take charge of 10 cities. So God put him over 10. But watch this. Then the second, verse 18, came and said, sir, your minor has earned five more. His master, he says the same thing. You, you answer, you take charge of five cities. His master never said anything negative to him. He was happy that he took what he had and he gained five. He didn't try to compare the ten with the five. And this is what Christians got to stop doing. We got to stop thinking that one church is better than the other because one church got more members than the other. I'm going over here because he got 20,000. They must be doing something right over at this church because he got more members than he got. Let me tell you something. If you're going to join a church or any group based on membership, there is a church uh, in China right now has 300,000 members. That's more than any church in America. I don't know no other church in America that has 300,000 members. If the largest church in America, attending church in America, is Joel Osteen Church. Church, right, 30,000 people go to Joel Olstein Church in over a weekend. That's the largest we got in this country. In, in China, there's a church with 300,000 people going. Guess what? This is a, a cult where a guy calling himself Jesus. But 300,000 people go. So if you're going to base, if somebody is right, based on how many members go there, they're going to 300,000. You're going to join that because half a lot of people go there? No. You should base on what the word of God said. If they're not coming from the word, you know, I don't care how many folks he got. I'm not going over there. As a matter of fact, back in the 1940s, there was another prophet, somebody in New York City. He told the people he was God had 10,000 members. 
And did you know when he died, he told the people he was going to come back again. There are people right now who grew up in that ministry still waiting on this prophet to come back. They, they, he said, they'll be waiting. There's no way. They're going to keep on waiting. So guess what? you got to remember, you got to stay in God's word. Don't worry about whatever everybody else is doing. The whole point is this. When you have your opportunity, what are you doing with the opportunity that God had given you? We get, now brings me down to the last point. Oh, yes. So God, he, he gives you opportunity whatever time you have on this earth. Then God. You, he's going to reward you on, on your, uh, I call it the uh, reward day, not judgment day for us. But here's something we really got to understand. This is really going to get you. The king condemns wasted opportunity. Listen to what he says uh, here in these verses we read. Then the third servant came. She said, sir, here is your minor. I have kept it, laid it away in a piece of cloth. I think King James Version says handkerchief. And I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and you reap what you did not sow. Now, watch this. I want you to understand uh, this person represents a, not a Christian. This person is not saved. This is a person who represents a fake Christian. So some of y'all don't believe in fake Christians. Yeah. Did you know there's a group of people that call themselves Christians, but they're not? There are people who look like, talk like, walk like a Christian, but they're not. You say, how could that be? Y'all heard of a person named Judas? Y'all remember him? Not only, watch this, Judas was part of the 12. Jesus picked him. And Jesus says, all of you are called, but one of you is the devil. He was talking about Judas. Now, when even at the, watch this, the day that Jesus, right before he died, they did the, the Lord's Supper, and then they was getting together, and Jesus says, the hand that dips his hand in the cup with me, this is the person that's going to betray me. Do you know all 12 said, is it I, Lord? See, they didn't all look, he must be talking about Judas. <laughs> they, they didn't even, they had not a clue that it was Judas. As a matter of fact, did you know Judas was the treasurer of the group? Judas was the one that's carrying the money bag. Judas was the one with the treasurer. His whole mentality was, I, oh, I'm only with Jesus to see what I can get out of it. But only Jesus knew his heart. The other 11 didn't know. I'm here to tell you there's folks in church that mean the church no good. But the only reason they're going to stay in church is because they want to keep up some mess in the church. <laughs> I don't want to go nowhere. My mama been there. My grandma been there. So listen, they ain't saved. They don't love God. They just want to keep some garbage going on in the church. Because if you really love God, you must use your opportunity to win some souls. So be careful. Be careful when you're talking to people. See, some people try to play that Christian role to get some information out of you. And then they're going to try to spread some other garbage around and try to lie. I'm telling you, you don't think that stuff going on in the church? Yes, it is. Churches have been destroyed from within, not from without. So we got we to gotta look at it, look at it. Don't, don't be that person that says you're a Christian. Jesus saw it. This king saw it. Watch this. He said, had you thought I was this bad person? Here's another thing. God is not evil. God is not bad. He, he's not out to get you. That's the wrong thing. This guy said, I knew you was a hard man, and I knew you didn't reap, you didn't sow, you didn't reap where you sowed and all that. He said, listen, if you thought I was such a bad person and that I was going to come and judge you hard, then you would have took the little minor that I gave you, then you would have put it at least in the bank account and let the bank put some interest on it, and then at least you could have gave me some interest. You didn't do anything with the money. You took it and you put it in a napkin and you sat on it. In other words, he didn't love God. And if a person don't love God, they don't belong to God. They can play like they belong to God. That's why, you know, I tell people, I tell the church this all the time. Listen, it's not our job, Christians, to go around. We not the Holy Ghost police. I'm not following behind your life in a car. Let me see what Deke doing. Yeah, let me see. Oh, I got something to tell the church now. I got something. To, look, you might see me walking down the street. Just, just an example. You might see me walking down the street and see me go inside of a bar. Now, you don't know why I went inside. I probably could have went in there to witness to somebody. I probably had to use the bathroom or something. I don't know. But you saw, listen, you calling everybody. Listen, I saw Reverend Eli. 
Y'all just don't know. I saw him walk up there. Y'all saw him walk in. See, so when you start spreading <laughs> those rumors of what you see, instead of coming to me, now this is what the Bible says, if you see me doing something, you're supposed to come to me. Now, Reverend, come here. I got to pull you to the side. I saw you. Then I could explain to you what was really going on. But if you go in here and start spreading the rumor already, what you didn't see, I could have been picking up somebody, taking them to the hospital. You don't know what was going on. But watch this. This person wasn't right. They did not know God. They did not have a relationship with God. And he's saying this. I, he says, I'm going to judge you with your own words, you wicked servant. There is no such thing as a servant who loves, who loves God and don't have a relationship with Christ. So this person himself, watch this, does not have a relationship with God. And as I go to my seat, I want to tell you this. You've got to use your opportunity every chance you get. Because guess what? We don't know how long we have. We don't know how long it will take for us to be on God's side, right? So we got to use the opportunity that we have to tell the dying world that Jesus Christ is Savior in this life. So take this opportunity. Take the time that you have. Take the time that you have to tell your loved ones that Jesus Christ is Savior. Take this opportunity to tell the dying world that it was Jesus who gave you his love and his grace. I want you to take this opportunity to tell the dying world that it was because your life around. You say, I'm going to take this opportunity to give out what was given to me. And can I tell you that God gave you his grace? Yes, he did. Over 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for your sins. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to shed his blood for you and I. Can I get a witness this morning? Do you know someone here? Have you been saved today? Did you give God your life? Did you give God your heart? Did you give God your mind? So can I tell you, you need to take this opportunity to tell a dying world, I don't know how long you have. I don't know how long we have, but I know we need to take the time we have to tell the dying world that Jesus Christ is Savior. We need to tell the world that he's coming back again. We need to tell the world that he saved our souls and he made us whole. But the number one thing we need to do, we got to live like it. We got to talk like it. We got to walk by faith and not by sight. We got to tell the world, for God I'll live and for God I'll die. We got to tell the world that God is still working with me. I'm not perfect yet, but I'm going to work for him. As long as i got a chance, I may fall down sometimes. I'm going to mess up sometimes. But one of these days, it won't be long. He's coming back for a church without a spot of recall. Can you say yes? Take this opportunity to be on the Lord's side. Take this opportunity because Jesus is soon to return. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand, Father, praise. Let me hear about all eyes closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you giving your name the praise, giving your name the glory, thanking you today for everything you have done. And we're going to take this opportunity. Oh, yes, the time that you have given us on this planet to share the gospel, to share with my lost family members, my lost friends, my lost associates, my lost co-workers, my lost neighbors, to share with them that Jesus is Savior. How do I know he's Savior? Because he saved my soul. He turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. Father, thank you that you did it for me. And if you can do it for me, I know you can do it for somebody else. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that you've given me to tell the world about your gospel. There may be somebody here who doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. If you're here today and you want to make Jesus your Savior today for the very first time, you never prayed that prayer to accept Jesus as your Savior, we're going to give you the opportunity right now to pray that prayer. So while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, please, if you need Jesus as your Savior, repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you 
as humble as I know how, give your name the praise and give your name the glory. Right now, I accept Jesus as my Savior because I am lost in my sins and I realize it and I know it. But right now, I believe in my heart that the Heavenly Father that you raised Jesus from the dead and I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord right now that he's going to take over my life in Jesus' name. Amen. The doors of the church are open to everyone standing. If you prayed that prayer first, the doors are open for you today. Will you come? Not only do you, can you come as a 